Thank you very much. You should be seeing my screen now. I took over took over your presentation. Um, so welcome everyone. A bit of a house cleaning rules for uh, for this uh, this webinar. Um, feel free at any point if you have any questions during the webinar. We'll be focusing on bringing uh, software uh, in a medical context in uh, to uh, to market from research to market. We have two speakers from Neurotech X Services uh, today, myself and Radhika. I was going to introduce herself in a, in a minute. Uh, we have two uh, amazing speakers as well from two uh, Canadian companies um, that will uh, that are operating in the software space um, with some AI. So uh, some of you might find a similar journey or path ahead of you or in uh, in, in the process. Um, so they will be introducing themselves and talking a little bit about the, the company, what they've learned, trying to share some uh, some experience, what they wished they knew before. Um, so it should be uh, very uh, valuable for you if you are looking ahead to commercialize a software from an idea from IP that you're developing in the lab, or if you're already in the process and you have questions, um, uh, will be we should be able to uh, to help you or at least address or point you in the right direction. So. The format for today, we'll start with a short 20 minute kind of framework. We'll, we'll talk uh, kind of like 360 business aspect of things from minimum viable product, um, value, value propositions, or some keywords that you might hear in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. And then we'll have 20 minute talks uh, from each speakers and we'll end uh, with a QA and a session. So don't wait at the end to ask your questions because you might forget as soon as they, as they, as they as they come, as they come up, uh, just ask your question in the in the chat uh, freely, um, so that we can provide as much value as possible during the, the last segment. Um, there is no dumb question. We're all at different level in the, or at all different uh, um, step of that journey in entrepreneurship and bringing uh, technology to market. So feel free to ask questions. If you don't feel comfortable in the chat, just uh, put in the public chat. Just put it to panelists so that we can we can see it and address it. Um, so a little bit on myself to uh, to start. My name my name is Yannick Roy. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Neurotech X Services and Neurotech X. Neurotech X is an international neurotech community. Uh, we we do have uh, several initiatives, and Neurotech X Services is a uh, consulting um, branch of Neurotech X, which Radhika will be able to introduce a bit more in a in a sec. Um, I'm uh, I'm finishing my PhD at University of Montreal. I've been uh, in the neurotech space for over over twelve years now. Um, I teach programming at ETS, uh, and I've been involved with many startups in the neurotech uh, neuroscience ecosystem for several years. Uh, I've been speaking with uh, different conferences, uh, radio, podcasts, TV shows, uh, things like that, and I've collaborated to organize uh, over 100 neurotech events uh, at this point. So I've been I've been around. I've seen a few things, and hopefully I'll be able to share some experience with uh, with you today. So Radhika, do you want to just quickly introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Jenny. So I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Neurotech X Services, which is the consulting and recruiting branch of Neurotech X. We provide tailored headhunting and consulting services, including strategic advisory investment and fundraising to various neurotech startups in the space. I'm a finance and marketing professional with experience across Fortune 500 companies in four countries and investment experience at a $400 billion Canadian pension fund. I'm an MBA from McGill University in Finance and a BCom from Marketing in UBC. And currently I'm an advisor to several neuroscience, neurotech startups in my capacity through Neurotech X. Awesome. So quickly the, uh, the agenda for the first part of the presentation um, will go kind of, as I said, 360 from a value prop, uh, market, uh, market analysis, business model, IP, uh, just kind of giving a, a rough framework of what it means to go to entrepreneur, like an entrepreneurship. We'll focus a bit more on the software aspect. We did a medical device uh, webinar um, over a month ago, um, but this one will be focusing a bit more on the software aspect of things. And uh, in collaboration with uh, with Neurosphere, we're also uh, launching a course. So Neurosphere will be able to announce it. Um, so make sure you follow Neurosphere on Twitter um, and different platforms uh, so that you can be informed because there will be an intro to uh, intro to neural entrepreneurs course uh, with, uh, with several resources that you might not want to miss. So first thing, when we talk about entrepreneurship uh, in any field, one of the, the first words that you will hear uh, over and over again, it really starts with the value proposition. 
So the value proposition is the idea of what are you, what, what's, the, what's the value that you're providing to your customer? So usually when we talk about value prop, whether it's an investor, whether it's uh, kind of a, at a, if you go to any uh, startup events, the first thing that people will ask is what's your value prop of your, of, your, of your business? Usually it's a sentence or a short paragraph explaining what your company does, who you bring value to, and why it's valuable or unique. So when we talk about value, it's we're talking about because value can can take different uh, forms. We're talking about reducing friction, saving times, better performance, lowering costs. So all all of the different aspects that can take value and what it is that you're providing uh, that is unique to uh, to your product or services. So that's the first that's the first thing that you will need to define as uh, as you're venturing in entrepreneurship. The second thing uh, as you move forward is to validate that idea. Um, in order to validate the, that idea that you're having, that it, you're actually providing value, you'll seek feedback. If you go to any um, incubator in, in Montreal, whether you go to Santec or any equivalent or, or District 3 or any others, one of the first thing that uh, they, will make you, they, they will make you do is uh, customer service. So the idea will be go out there and interview as many uh, customers as possible, depending on your field of activity. It might be a smaller pool or a bigger pool, depending on how easy it is to access uh, your customer. But the idea is really to go and talk with the people that you're going to serve. Um, so who you're going to sell your product or who's the decision maker. So sometimes the, the buyer is not necessarily the same person using it or taking the decision if we, if we go ahead with your product or solution. Um, in the, and the best way of getting feedback and real feedback, I would say, is commitment. So if you go down the street and you ask a bunch of different people what they think about your idea, the feedback will be a little biased because most people won't want to hurt your feelings. Um, so they will say, yes, it's a very good idea. Yes, I would buy your product. And then you will come back and you'll think that you have an amazing idea and that, that everybody will buy. It. And then next thing you know, you release your product and people are not necessarily buying it. So in terms of feedback, the best one is commitment in the sense that if you can get a, either a letter of intent, an exchange of cash, people willing to pay, this is the ultimate feedback that you can receive. If people are exchanging money from your service uh, or your product, then you know that that it's, it's, uh, it's working and it's valuable for them. If they're not willing to pay nor to commit, so sometimes it's not necessarily the, the, the money because your product is not ready uh, just yet, so they don't want to exchange money, but sometimes just a letter of intent that if you're successful in delivering your product, then we'll, be, uh, we'll, we'll buy it. Uh, that's a very good feedback to, uh, to prove that your idea is a, is a good one. In order to get there um, in different steps, Usually we used to kind of work on an idea, product or service, mainly, mainly a, pro a product for years, putting a bunch of features and working three, four, five years in stealth mode on our product and then releasing it. And it costs millions and millions of dollars. And then what people realized is that actually customers were looking for one specific features, but we released a hundred features that nobody really cares about. So in the new entrepreneurship startup world, what we've seen evolving as a, as, a, as a model is more of a agile way of iterating faster and bringing stuff to, to market or to the end of the customer um, faster you know, in order to get to measure stuff and get more feedback and iterate quicker with the customer in of making the ultimate product and services for the people that you are serving. So usually a little like in academia is that you have an idea, which at that point is more of an hypothesis that people will be using that, that it's providing value. So you will want to, to build some sort of a proof of concept that what you're doing works uh, and uh, to kind of like really proof, proof that the, the, the concept works. After that, you'll move more into a prototype, building a little something that you can bring to different uh, trade shows, to a different environment, to a, a clinic, an hospital, and try to get a bit more um, uh, feedback and validation on site with a clunky prototype. It's not the product that you're going to sell, but it's kind of like halfway there. And then some of the, 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 new, the new term in the, well, the new term for a couple of years, but that people might not be so familiar with if you're coming from academia, is this idea of a minimum viable product. The idea here with the minimum viable product is what's the minimum thing that I need to build in order to, uh, to address my customer so that the customer can actually buy it, purchase the, the product and give feedback based on that, uh, on that product. So you wanna get to the, minimum, to the minimum viable product as fast as possible uh, with, with the minimum. So as the name entails, it's really what's the minimum package that I can, that I can put out there. Um, 
So that's the minimum viable product. And then you start iterating and adding features. So I'll let, I'll let uh, Radhika take over with the business model. Thanks, Yanni. So there are three levels to our market analysis, the TAM, the SAM, and the SUM. TAM is the total available market. While a company will never likely achieve a point where it addresses every potential customer on the market, this value provides a good indication of the theoretical potential at scale. For example, for an MRI scanner software, this would be the Val the um, number of scans in a year multiplied by the average revenue per scan. Um, if you sell a medical software, this could essentially be about selling your device to any place that might need it. SAM is the serviceable available market. Unlike TAM, SAM represents a portion of the market which a company can realistically address or service. Once again, fully capturing SAM is nearly impossible. Although a startup business plan should aim to capture a growing portion of the SAM throughout the years. For example, still in the case of software as a medical device, this could essentially be about selling your software to every Canadian medical institution that might need it. SAM or the serviceable obtainable market represents the true objective that a company can aim for in light of its specific context or reality. For example, geography, competitive pressures, distribution channels, budget, etc. This measure is one of the most objective for an early investor because it represents a realistic objective for a given startup. Still in the example of a software as a medical device, this could be about selling your software to specific types of clinics in the Quebec region. What's important is that it's remembered that it's important to try and estimate these values that it gives you a sense of the market potential and, and is necessary to engage with future investors. You can estimate these values using a top-down or a bottom-up approach, though ideally you will consider both. The bottom-up appro bottom approach tends to be more precise and easier to defend. Neuro startups can hope for a larger proportion of the SAM and SUM due to the lower level of competition and the necessity of the products. Time frame is also important here. So for example, for TAM, you could have a longer time frame, whereas for SAM and SUM, you may want to have a shorter time frame. What's important is to remember to align goals to a relevant time frame. On the next slide, we have mapping your company's ecosystem. Why is ecosystem mapping important? It gives us the big picture and ensures understanding of stakeholder interactions, which is particularly important to understand client goals and priorities. It helps us understand important details to anticipate problems and needs the client may not see, to uncover important details the client didn't mention, and to clarify our understanding so we don't make any wrong assumptions. It supports key business decisions. Ecosystem mapping can give you a roadmap for the future and it helps to ensure that you have a proper roadmap at all. Understanding the competition. Um, there are multiple ways to under, understand, analyze competitors and this process can get extremely complicated. We've presented just one way to do so up on the slide here. Um, the point here is that it's more important that others know how you're actually different and what your edge is. It is useful as a tool to either get inspired from your competitors or to learn how to differentiate yourself from your competitors. Not all the information listed here is available or relevant, but what's important is that you should be able to defend your position relative to your competitors. Preparing for a SWOT analysis. A SWOT accounts for internal factors and external factors. It stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Let's take the example of a software as a medical device company. Strengths and weaknesses address the internal capabilities of the company. So a strength could be the quality of the algorithm involved and its ability to solve the customer pain point involved. Weaknesses could involve the lack of a formal distribution network, poor knowledge of the regulatory landscape, or a lack of industry partnerships. 
opportunities and threats involve the external landscape and the effect it can have on the company. An opportunity could be easing regulations for software as a medical device or medical device companies looking for active partnerships with software providers. Threats could be the competitive environment, increasingly stringent regulations, or the availability of substitutes, for example, a new drug that addresses the same pain points. Overall, a SWOT analysis is a good, strong basis for strategic plans because it allows you to leverage your own internal strengths and weaknesses to manage your external environment. Freedom to operate. Freedom to operate addresses whether it's even possible for you to operate your software due to commercial or regulatory constraints. Researching this is the key to your success. We have come up with six golden rules to ensure that you have uh, freedom to operate. These are up on the slides so you can read them. Um, what's important is that your intellectual property rights are active. Uh, this will follow in the conversation that Yannick will have, and it's important to understand that IP is a part of market mapping. Business model. A business model addresses how a company will eventually be profitable. The most critical piece to this is the who. Your target customer segment should be the focal point on which all your other questions converge. What you offer the customer is your value proposition. How you deliver that value proposition to your customer will become your value chain. And why you are targeting your customer becomes the basis for the revenue model. Revenue models can take on many forms, such as a subscription model or a paper use model. Ultimately, there's no one right business model. What's important is that you answer the key questions highlighted on the slide and are able to create a coherent narrative that addresses the key profitability questions. What's a business plan? How a company conducts its activities and creates values or the fleshing out of the business model of the, is the business plan. It encompasses all key aspects necessary to conduct a company or entity's activities, such as strategy, operations, organizational structure, distribution channels, revenue and cost models, partners, clients, team, but also technology and IP, et cetera. It's very easy to get lost in the course of our business. The business plan helps us find our way. It is meant to steer the business in the right direction, it also helps give comfort to investors that the business has a clear sense of direction and purpose. About 80% of small businesses fail in three to five years. Over 80% of small businesses lack a business plan. Now we know that correlation does not equal causation, but this is a worthwhile observation nonetheless. And now I'll hand it over to Yannick. Awesome, thanks Radhika. Um, so most of you are probably coming from academia, so you're familiar with, uh, with IP in general, with intellectual property. Um, being a creation of the mind, it doesn't have to be tangible necessarily. Um, it's just something that uh, was in your mind, some sort of idea, and then it can translate into uh, different categories. So um, the, I, I, I'm going to be very brief on the, the IP. It's not a full class, but uh, and some of you have probably heard the, the, the terms before. So you have different uh, buckets of, um, of IP that you can protect. The idea here is really to have a strategy to address the full landscape or portrait of how you're going to protect your IP. Um, that needs to be core of your and your business, your business plan. And then when you talk with uh, with investors and stakeholders, uh, you need to to be able to show that you have a strategy to protect uh, the 360 of your business. Um, the different buckets that we usually talk about will be the copyright, the patents, the trademark, and the trade secret. So as we're going to talk in a minute, the copyright more for the software. Patents uh, also, obviously, from uh, from some methods, some hardware. Um, there is different kind of patents. The trademark, which protects the, the brand itself. Uh, if you have uh, either a logo, the brand, uh, if you coin new terms, uh, some products or the name of the companies, things like that. And trade secrets are the thing that you don't want to disclose uh, publicly. You want to keep for, for yourself. Uh, you're doing it in a special way and you don't want anybody to, to know. So you just keep it as a secret. The downside of that is that if, uh, if it 
if it's known, if there's a leak or something, then you're not protected um, to, uh, to claim it or uh, to, uh, to be able to legally pursue any, uh, any action. So since we're talking about software, I just want to uh, reiterate uh, something that most people don't necessarily know as, we, uh, as we're entering an era of sharing code of open source mentality, and especially with, uh, with Miguel being at the forefront of uh, trying to lead a more open, uh, open framework from uh, open science, open source, open data. Um, and with the code, a lot of people in academia uh, were used to just, here's the code, and we just put it out, and we assume that because it's out, people can use it. Uh, but it's very important that if you want to share your code, you, you need to have a license um, because it's not because it's open on the internet that you can use it. I think that the best example is images on the internet. It's not because we can see an image that we can use it. Um, so it's the same thing with your code. If you're putting it out there and you want people to be able to use it, you need to put it on paper on writing that people can use it and what can they use it for and what can't they use it for. Um, and if you're gonna do that, why write a custom piece of paper and why not just use a template one, which is what a license uh, is. So there is different categories of license from more on the, the left side to the right side, more permissive uh, that, uh, that allows people more freedom or some others that are a bit more uh, tight in, uh, in what the, the software can be, can be used for. But I just wanna reiterate that uh, you always need to put a license. Otherwise you kind of create a gray zone where people feel like they can use it, but technically speaking, you can go after them legally after. So just put a license when you share your, your code. Um, as, as I just mentioned, we're, and we all feel it, I think nowadays that we're definitely moving towards a more open source mentality uh, for different reasons. Uh, Linux and Microsoft have been at war for, for ages on the proprietary versus open source. And we even these big players such as Microsoft are moving into the open source. Microsoft uh, used to be the, the, the ultimate symbol of proprietary software. Uh, Bill Gates want, just wants to make to make money out of uh, Microsoft, so they've had that image for years, and now they are actually one of the biggest contributor in the open source world and open source community. And they acquired GitHub in 2018, which is kind of like the number one software platform uh, on the on the internet. So, with that uh, with with that in mind, and I wanted to just acknowledge the open source mentality because, uh, as I said, Miguel is kind of like one of the the leading uh, institution who wants to go more and more open, which I think is definitely a good, uh, good way to move forward. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move uh, faster a little bit. We can come back on different things uh, during the Q&A, depending on where you want to bring us. But I want to give more time to the, to the speakers uh, themselves. So I'm just going to skip these ones um, and jump into write the, the, the software and what we're going to be discussing with the two companies and hopefully with the, the Q&A session, which the specificity of what how is a software different than medical device that we've heard uh, before? And how does that impact with the FDA clinical trials and, and these kinds of things? Um, so in all the regulation uh, based on geography, so by countries uh, in the US, they have their, uh, their own way of looking at it um, and in Canada as well. So you need to make sure you understand where you're gonna be selling your, uh, your device, your, your software and understand the regulation that applies there uh, based on the based on the country, but they they are all developing. I think that what you need to keep in mind is that this is a fast slash slow moving industry where uh, the regulation agencies are trying to adapt to the modern world of software. We have more uh, smartphone than ever, more tablet, and more uh, software as a medical device are being used. Um, so it's important that to understand that, regu that regulatory agencies are trying to adapt as quick as possible why, uh, while protecting the public, because safety is obviously number one in their, in their, their priority list. Um, so I would invite you to read the, uh, the all of kind of device software as, as a medical device section guidance draft. We have that for the, the FDA, uh, and we have that in Canada as well. In terms of regulation, we have the FDA and kind of uh, the, the agency that will regulate a bit more on the safety and efficacy of what you're claiming that your device and your software does. Uh, but you also have other, I would say, peripheral regulatory agencies. Uh, for example, in the, uh, in the US, there is the FTC, uh, because what we've seen over the past couple of, uh, couple of years is a lot of companies are trying to pivot their marketing from a medical device to more a consumer wellness, uh, device to avoid going down the FDA road 
and hitting the market faster and saving a lot of money uh, in doing so. However, the marketing of your device and all the claims that you're making are also regulated by different regulatory agencies. The FTC is more on the, the marketing side of things and Lumosity was a good example a couple of years ago who got fined for $2 million uh, for being deceptive in their advertising because they were making some claims, uh, some medical claims, but also uh, they were they, they were stating that uh, it's been studied and that was uh, some clinical clinical trials that were done with some of the words. So just be careful with the claims that you're doing, both on the uh, the clinical validation, but also the medical terms that you are using in your in your claims. Um, as I said, uh, Santé Canada, and hopefully we'll hear from the uh, from the from the two companies that we have how how they. What they what they had to go through in terms of the, uh, the 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 software and the the Santé Canada um, uh, clearance. So uh, I invite you to read the guidance document that the uh, that uh, Santé Canada or Health Canada released in 2019 for software as a medical device uh, for the classifications and how to uh, consider your medical software as a medical device. Um, and we'll go in more details and as I said in the Q and A, depending on where you guys want to want to take it. So. I'm going to go over to Radhika again to wrap up this before we end over to our uh, two speakers. Thanks, Yannick. So the ultimate payer for your service is important to understand as it influences your pricing and marketing strategies. So in all the three cases mentioned on the slide here, the ultimate beneficiary is the patient. However, the intermediaries and payers vary based on the scenarios presented here. For example, in the case where a medical institution pays for an insured product or service used for patient procedures, um, the intermediaries are the public and private insurers, while the payers are health and healthcare providers and insurers, both public and private. The key takeaway here is that while the ultimate beneficiary may be a single individual, payers can be multiple and complex best based on the service provided. Insurance system in the US. There are two main processes here, the commercial health insurance and the government payers. Um, what's important here is that you have a health technology assessment. These are both internal to insurers and external independent committees. These are committees that provide reviews of new technologies and provide an evaluation of the properties, effects, and or impacts, including the social, economic, organizational, and ethical issues of new medical devices or software in our case. Um, they're not completely uniform and they can vary across different payers. Overall, um, the HTAs can be cons and the insurance process can be all considered almost as important as regulation, given the cost of the devices and procedures without insurance. Um, the insurance process needs to be planned in parallel and in cohesion with regulatory requests. Insurance system in Canada. The insurance system in Canada follows a similar logic to the US, even if it's a different Medicare system. The key difference here is that for the software as a medical device, it has to be approved at the regional, provincial, and the hospital levels. There are HTAs at many levels that go through their own independent approvals process. The power to the hospital administrators and decision makers is also higher as they can call their own HTAs. This is more frequent for hospitals with sophisticated and or expensive medical devices or rely on HTAs used by provincial or regional authorities. Team and early roles. Finding your first founders is a hard problem as finding a part business partner is akin to marriage. Ray Inamoto said that you only need three personalities to found a team, a hipster, a hacker, and a hustler. The hipster is the innovator or the artistic personality that sets the creative vision for the team. The hacker is the technical individual who will ensure your product has the technical chops to go to market and the hustler is the evangelical individual who will sell the vision of your products to customers and investors. Beyond what's on the slide, what's really important here is that you find complementary people to get on board with. And wherever you lack knowledge or have gaps in your understanding, get advisors when needed. 
culture. Once you have your own startup, it's a chance to make the culture your own, but it's important to pay attention in the beginning as the project and business progresses. The work ethic, corporate culture, and environment you foster in the early days will follow your organization for years to come. So remember that these early interactions and actions have a long-term consequence. The art of pitching. Storytelling is everything, whether it's for your elevator pitch, your sales pitch, investor pitch, etc. Storytelling is key because it communicates the main ideas of your startup in a simplified and accessible form. Major don'ts here are using jargon or technical language that makes the idea inaccessible, using too many details that take away from the key points of your startup, and a lack of integrity. The pitch must always remain honest. Now to tell a good story, make complexity easy to understand by simplifying it communicate only the relevant details, and use emotions to convey the passion behind your story. Thank you. I'll hand over to Yannick to introduce the speakers and continue the webinar. Thank you, Radhika. Um, so hopefully we're able to a kind of a, in a very short amount of time, try to give a framework for entrepreneurship. Um, and now we're going to hear from two uh, Canadian companies that have been through the process, and hopefully they will be able to share their, uh, their experience and give you some, uh, some insights. So the first one uh, is Robert Fertilla, uh, who's the co-founder and VP of AI at AI, AI, Fred, AI Fred Health, um, a, a company out of McGill. So I'm very excited to uh, be introducing him. So Robert, if you want to come and join us and you can take over and share your screen and the floor will do um okay. i will stop the other person sharing their yep. screen you can pick me out share and then i will bring this up all right, please, uh, please make sure that I stay on time so that <laughs> so I don't go over. Um, so Perfect. thank you so much, uh, Yannick and Radhika for, for the invite today. Um, that was a lot of information that they were just presenting. So I'll try my best to, to showcase how we have sort of tried to fit that mold uh, to give you a story of how, how we started out and where we are today. Uh, so first, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, you know, I'm, I'm Robert, and I'm going to be uh, sort of walking you through the story of, of AFRID and how we're trying to tackle clinical decision support, clinical decision support uh, in mental health. Um, so very briefly, we see a massive problem um, in trial and error for, uh, tr for patients trying to recover from depression. Uh, when they go into the, the doctor of an office, uh, they will often be uh, prescribed many different treatments over many uh, different months. Um, and it's really hard for them to find what's right for them. What I'm gonna be going over today, uh, here's a bit of a summary slide on, on uh, where we are today. Uh, so we are currently in discussions with Health Canada, the FDA, um, and we're actually a part of the X Prize. So for those who are not aware, the X Prize is a global competition uh, where we remain one of the top three uh, finalists uh, representing Canada to uh, to try to have the most impactful startup uh, of them all uh, within within the scope of that competition. So really trying to meet a global need uh, where it is. And so let me just jump straight into it. Why start with depression? Uh, so it's the leading cause of medical disability worldwide, um, astronomical costs involved in over $1 trillion uh, globally. Um, and there's a lot of US patients that are treated at the first line with uh, these family doctors, general practitioners that are poorly equipped to, to handle uh, some of the cases of uh, depression. And as I mentioned earlier, this trial and error approach where they're essentially taking the uh, um, uh, taking, you know, the top five drugs that they can come to mind or top five therapies and trying to see what sticks. Um, so it often doesn't work. Um, and, you know, there must be a better way for us to help use historical information to provide patterns um, and more support for these physicians. Uh, some of the milestones. So when we incorporated in 2017, um, we went through a huge uh, undertaking to try to take something like this to markets. 
Um, and we can see here uh, one of the important uh, components of this is finding uh, your uh, customers um, and finding people that you can uh, you work with. And so, um, you know, we can see co-marketing agreements. So that's an awesome way for you to validate your ideas. Um, and one of the major uh, key factors to consider, especially when going through the medical device uh, route, is validating your idea works in a, a certain population. And so we actually conducted a series of little trials to sort of building up to one massive trial uh, starting this year. Uh, so in uh, December, we started what is called an ease of use study. Um, it's essentially a series of a simulation environments where we're able to, uh, to put doctors and patients into this environment where it's you know, safe, um, and just to see that we're, we're testing uh, the validity of some of our early assumptions. Um, but as you're going, the idea is to like try to validate those assumptions as early as possible so that when you get to like a really big uh, clinical trial um, that you don't uh, waste your money. Um, so what is it that we're building? Uh, so it's a, a software platform uh, that is designed to mediate the interactions between physicians and patients where the doctors can help collect more information from the patient about uh, questionnaires regarding uh, depression, uh, trying to track all of their different uh, key characteristics, demographics. Um, and our system can help put all of that together in an easily digestible manner, um, powered by AI so that we can help uh, provide the, uh, the patient and the physician with more personalized information on how they can get better treated. Um, so ideally what this can lead to is higher rates of remission. So people getting better faster um, and also reduced time so that more physicians can get through more patients, thereby helping more people. And the idea is not to replace doctors by any means. The idea is to just help support it in the way that they can process a lot more data at the same time. So to help, um, to help out uh, the physician. Uh, so what does it look like underneath the hood? <laughs> we have sort of two main branches of this. We have a best practice guideline. Um, so this will optimize the current gold standard. Um, this is something that we've been piloting uh, through a lot of our earlier studies. And now we're introducing an AI model that can actually help provide more personalized treatment recommendations um, to the physician. And this is something that we consider the medical device component of it. This is something that's actually novel. And so this is the process that we're going through of regulatory approval that I can speak to more a little bit later. So overall, what we're hoping to do is by helping more people get better faster, we can reduce the cost uh, for the uh, providers of healthcare. Uh, we can help the patients get better sooner and for the doctors to get through more patients, thereby helping the entire community. Um, so something that we've been seeing through our various uh, trials, um, our expectations have actually been uh, exceeding. So 50% of the physicians would like to use it with all their patients. So traditionally, um, this is a number that would be a lot lower in a lot of other cases. Um, and we're actually super excited to see that introducing a new tool, yet another tool in an arsenal for a doctor. Um, it's actually quite hard to get into that space because you want it to be quick and snappy uh, and to provide that value. 90% uh, of physicians would use it with some patients. Um, so again, that's an astronomical uh, number that we were super excited to see more and more uh, doctors wanting to use it. Um, and 68% of patients uh, were using the platform for two or more consecutive weeks. So again, when we think about these metrics of uh, trying to get the, um, the patient to use it on a reoccurring basis, uh, will help provide more information for the doctor to better treat that individual. Um, and it'll also help inform the AI model uh, to provide even more uh, improved personalized uh, predictions. Uh, when we think about a business model revenue, uh, just again, harping on those, those earlier uh, topics. Um, so our initial customer is managed care providers in the US, um, you know, in Canada and also telemedicine. So 
especially in the area of COVID, we want to make it as easy as possible to get the treatment you need. Um, and so thankfully, we have a lot of, of support in terms of like virtual connect connectivity between them. Um, so this is a space that we can easily sort of integrate with because there's, there's a lot of synergy between these, uh, these particular customers and the willingness to take on um, these uh, virtual care products. And we're operating under the, uh, the software as a license uh, model um, and pricing it per patient. And the idea of all of this is we want to make it as easy and accessible as possible for patients um, and doctors so that when they're coming in to get care, they don't have to worry about how much is this going to cost me. So that's why we're trying to keep it as free as possible. Um, now to get into a little bit of the advice, um, a little bit more speaking candidly. Uh, so one thing that we're super happy we did um, is hiring a professional CEO. So amongst myself and, and my co-founders, we actually started this while we were still uh, students at McGill uh, University. Um, I represent the, the hacker from the previous uh, uh, archetype. Uh, so I'm sort of the, the technical co-founder building all the little tools uh, and gadgets in between. Um, and one thing that we missed is having that professional CEO to really bring us to that next level. Um, I'd like to also sort of talk about team at this point. When you are starting to grow your company, it's incredibly important that you focus on the people, especially when you are at the pre-seed round um, or a seed round of investments. The investors really look closely at you, the individual, the people around you, the people that you're surrounding yourself with. Uh, making sure that you have those complementary skill sets um, and that you're really passionate about what you're doing is super important. Um, and as soon as we brought on uh, our uh, the professional CEO, we've seen like a huge amount of uptick in our investor relations um, and the direction of the company. It's, everything's just been accelerating. Um, so this is a super critical thing that we were super happy about. On the other side of things, um, one thing we wish we knew is regulatory compliance um, and the details for how to get it into the market. Um, so I do thank uh, uh, Yannick and Radica for going through some of those details with you all today. And it's a lot to digest. Um, this takes, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and as they mentioned, these regulatory uh, governing bodies are actually learning as, as we go, uh, especially when we deal with uh, something like an artificial intelligent agent being a medical device itself um, is has not been covered before um, and there's definitely a lot of work in trying to get them to understand what are the key considerations for you know data data use data practicing uh, data privacy um, and what that means in building a model updating a model what are the assumptions that you're making about the underlying uh, uh, data and the populations that you can serve so for example, um, we have a lot of data surrounding like North America and certain parts of Europe, um, and we can build models on top of that, but ultimately we can't use um, a model that is built on that data and distributed to another area of, of the world um, that doesn't follow that key demographic. And so it's incredibly important that when you are thinking about who you would like this to help, is that you're thinking really closely on what the base data set that you're using and what are the base assumptions. Um, whether you can relax those assumptions or you can help build more isolated versions of that, um, that's gonna be super important. Um, as I get more into regulatory compliance details, some of the things that uh, we wish we knew sort of ahead of time, uh, and it's something that we, we were aware of, but we weren't exactly sure about the scope of how, how large this is. Now, at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you build a tool that is not going to harm anyone. Um, and so oftentimes we can get caught up in the fact that like, oh, you know, we're getting bogged down, we're going so slow, we can't, uh, you know, push out our products. But at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you are building something that will help someone and not in fact uh, hurt someone. And sometimes you can try to go as fast as you can, but as long as you have that governing principle, um, you're going to do the world right. And so some of the things, uh, in more detail, some of the things that we were uh, focused on is a statistical analysis plan, uh, an SAP. Um, so 
when you are going into a clinical trial of this kind, you have to make sure that you're covering the right metrics. Uh, this is again, very dependent on the type of company that you would like to build. Um, you know, for us, it's you know, tracking how well are our patients getting, how fast uh, are they getting to remission? Um, you know, what is the time spent? So tracking all of these individual metrics are, that are important for you and your business um, is something that you should have enough of a statistical validation surrounding those metrics so that you can say with definitive proof when you go to make your application to say, hey, FDA governing body, can you take a look at this because we have you know, reason to believe and here's the facts that ours is better than the current gold standard and thus you, know, you, should, you should approve it. Um, and that sort of branches out into many other mini validation plans that we see, whether it's whether you're, you're interested in machine learning or, or artificial intelligence, how do you validate that your model is working as it should? Or how do you validate that the, the tool, the product that you're building is working as intended? Um, so for those who are not familiar with uh, like software engineering principles, uh, we have this like unit testing mentality. Um, so that's the sort of a similar mentality that you want to take with this. You want to make sure that every input that you're getting, every output is accounted for. Um, and this is something that these regulatory bodies are also looking for and to make sure that you know, uh, you know what you're looking for um, and that you're covering all your bases. Another thing I'd like to suggest for this is to stay in contact with these uh, governing bodies early in the process, um, because the last thing you want to do is to go through years of research and clinical trials, just that when you make the final application that they deny it for some simple reason, because, um, because you missed something early on. And so it's extremely important while it is, you know, sometimes anxiety inducing to reach out to these these people and start like pitching your idea. Uh, these are my validation plans. This is my study protocol. Um, what do you think? And they can help sort of guide you. They won't, they won't say whether this, is, this can be or cannot be approved, but they'll help guide you in the right direction in terms of what are you thinking. Um, the next step is quality management system. Uh, so this is something that is also critical um, is es essentially a, a principle of how you are developing your product. Whether it's a hardware, whether it's a software, the same principles apply. Um, and it all has to do with when you go to approve your, your medical device, a lot of times they look at the process involved of, of designing this. So when we think of software and the agility of software, that how fast it could be to deploy to production, it's incredibly demanding and, and time consuming to have to submit an approval for each iteration of your of your product. You made a slight tweak to the uh, UI um, or how a certain algorithm works. You have to go through a completely new set of, of uh, application and approvals. As opposed to if you have a solid funnel and pipeline for generating these updates, they can be much more confident in those additions that you make or modifications that you make to the platform because the process by which that was conducted has been approved. So making sure they have the right, uh, uh, the right documentation, uh, document versioning, any, any idea that comes up, any uh, uh, collaboration on a, on a topic or things that you work through, make sure to have that documented because it'll always come in handy. It's, this is one of those cases, especially when we talk about like medical devices and software as a medical device, the more documentation, the better. You can never have too much. Um, more specific to Health Canada, when you go through a lot of these clinical trials, um, it's always uh, crucial you know, that you have the right uh, ethics, uh, ethics approvals and what we call an investigational testing authorization uh, from, the, from Health Canada to say, yes, you are allowed to conduct this study. Um, no matter how much of a simulation it is or with like a handful of patients or doctors, it's always important and critical that you, you do the right things at each step of the way. Um, because at any point in time, you can always get audited uh, for any of the previous steps. Um, so again, this is to make sure that the tools that you're building are, are super safe to use in real life. Um, let me go to the next slide. Okay, so on top of that, one costly miscalculation. When we talk about clinical trials, 
they are expensive. <laughs> so especially when it comes to being a startup, you are already bootstrapped. You probably don't have too many funds. Um, and one of the most important things to not uh, overlook is just how much it's going to cost you to test and validate all of your hypotheses in your product. Um, so the two main things that sort of a, a subset of this is to learn what needs to be collected uh, from your clinical tri trial to, to like definitively validate if your idea works or it doesn't. Um, so again, you don't want to track too much to the point where it becomes over way too expensive, but you want to make sure that you're tracking the right metrics depending on your product um, so that you know at the end of it, um, it's, it's worthwhile. And lastly, uh, something we noticed uh, with trial budgeting they're going to continue to rise as you as you start to learn more. So does your your cost goes up, um, and this is sort of a natural fact. If you can just sort of jump the gun on the gun on this and start learning about the different components that you would need to include in your in your trial, um, the sooner and less uh, jarring of a uh, of a surprise this would be to you and your investors, because a lot of times the investors that you seek are already quite familiar with what it's like to get uh, a product like this, like whatever you're creating through uh, these governing bodies. And so they are aware of how expensive some of these can be. So you know, feel free to, when you're budgeting, to give yourself ample room and ample buffer uh, to, to get those, uh, those outcome metrics that you, that you need. Um, so lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit more about commercialization. So sort of broad strokes. Learning the ins and outs of clinical trials um, is one of the more um, time consuming and sort of hidden, hidden scares uh, that has, has really been one of the, the largest areas of growth for us as a company. Uh, so I myself, I'm, my background is in computer science um, and biology. So I have uh, not participated a lot in uh, regulatory activities or like setting up clinical trials um, and neither has a lot of my other co-founders and so make sure that you are surrounding yourself with folks uh, that understand this process and that's sort of i don't want to skip that too early to the third point but understanding what is the minimum viable like metrics uh, for you to get out of your clinical trial will be super important um, and when we think about software, you have to think about how, how agile it can be. Don't be afraid to rebuild versions of your product. It's something that we've done. Um, the first thing you build will never be the, the last thing that you build. You're always going to be iterating. So don't be super attached to that first thing. It's always an idea. And you're, it's always going to be growing with the company as the, the company's needs start to grow as well. And lastly, one of the things that we are super thankful for um, are the people around us, the communities that we've built. Um, and the, the networks that we've been able to, to, to uh, sink into. So whether it's being part of uh, uh, like incubators um, or accelerators, these are great programs to help give you the, uh, the network that you need to find uh, the people that, that you need. So for example, whether it's having someone uh, who is a, a scientific advisor who can help validate your plan, your scientific studies, or regulatory folk who can help walk you through exactly what you need. Um, so I think I'm running out of time, um, but I would love to, to take more questions at the end. Um, so feel free, we can talk more about this. Anyway, a little bit of information if you wanna reach out. Um, I do thank you for your time and uh, uh, take it away, Yannick. Thank you, Robert. That was that was great. We had the what is the business doing? We had some of the uh, the key uh, lessons learned. Um, that uh, that was an amazing share from uh, from you, and hopefully that will inspire some uh, some questions as well from uh, from the audience and people that might have uh, felt that they were at the at the similar point, and would like to have more uh, detailed answer on some of these uh, the the lessons that you've learned. Um, but just before we dive into the uh, the, the Q and A, uh, we'll have a different uh, perspective. Um, so if uh, so, thank you once again, Robert. And we'll now invite uh, Bilal um, Bimal Lakani, who's uh, the VP Product and Lead Scientist at Health Tech Connects and Neuro uh, Neurocatch Inc. 
Um, so we'll uh, dive into a bit of a different, uh, yet still in the, the software as a medical device. Um, so Yamal, if you want to take it away. Yeah, great. Thanks very much, uh, Yannick and Radhika and McGill and Neurotech X for having me here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about our experience uh, navigating our path from lab discovery to medical innovation uh, at Health Tech Connects and NeuroCatch. So we're based just outside of Vancouver, so uh, other side of the country here. Uh, we are kind of joint, and I'll give you a quick disclaimer, I got to make sure I get this up because we are a medical device. Um, it's a licensed device in Canada, not licensed anywhere else in the US or in Europe yet. Um, so just get that out of the way. My background is actually uh, not in software. So I am a neuro, neuro, neuroscience uh, PhD. I did uh, my PhD at uh, University of Toronto and my postdoc here at UBC, uh, all in neuroimaging. And uh, I got really interested in this company that was just getting going and started about a year earlier. And I'd heard about it locally and I was really curious about what they were up to. So I, I really attached myself to this idea of taking my academic experience and moving it into a product development space for medical devices. Um, and so really what I'm going to talk about today are all my learnings. So these are, you know, it's, it's everything I'm going to share here is, is things I've learned along the way in the last five years at this company. Um, and they're really sort of the big takeaways that I've had. Uh, there's a lot more, but they're just sort of the, the high level ones. So in terms of backstory about uh, our company as a whole, so we actually do several different things, which is we're, we're a bit interesting in that way. Uh, Neurocatch is the company I primarily represent. Um, and our parent is called Health Tech Connect. So really Health Tech Connects has all three of these underneath it. And the idea here started to build a measurement device of brain function, specifically cognitive function. So NeuroCatch was born out of that concept uh, with a very small team set to focus on building that medical device. Uh, but as the company got going, uh, we actually started a research arm and it was great. Robert talked about clinical trials and how important they are. Uh, we have a clinical trial center directly built into our, our center, which is called the Health Tech Connects Center for Neurology Studies. So the idea is that we measure, we test. This is a team of clinical professionals that tests our devices independently, but also brings in into other devices. So Robert, if you need uh, clinical trial sites, you can always reach out to us and the other companies are looking for sites. We do offer that service to sort of get devices through regulatory approvals. And then we were so interested in the technologies we were seeing uh, we wanted to apply them right on site. So we opened up the Surrey Neuroplasticity Clinic. These are all on the same floor. And that's a full functioning uh, clinic with physiotherapists, kinesiologists, occupational therapists, psychologists that take some of those new clear devices by Health Canada and brings them into treatment adjunct uh, to traditional occupational physical therapy. And the really nice thing is you can see this all feeds back into itself like a flywheel. And so we get to learn from the experience of the Center for Neurology Studies and the clinic and bring that back into medical device development with our team. And so I'll kind of walk into that quickly and I'll, I'll share the similar learning here. So I'd like to start with a picture of our team. This is across all of our companies. Uh, and to me, this is one of the biggest things I'm happy about with our group. So if I'm reflecting, we were really lucky to get a talented team to do this. And you know, I'm lucky to get to talk about the work that they've all done, uh, but this is really them that's put this together. And I just get to be the spokesperson for it. So this is, this is uh, we spend a lot of time recruiting interviewing, I'm sure like every company, uh, but we really pride ourselves on the team we put together uh, at NeuroCatch and Health Tech Connects. So what is our device based on? Well, it's really on this simple concept that you can't treat what you can't measure. And so there's a lot of vital signs that exist in the world. You're familiar with blood pressure, heart rate, uh, pulse oximetry. And you really think about it, there's nothing for your brain. Uh, there's nothing you can go into your doctor's office and say, you know, how's my brain doing today? And so this was sort of the idea from our founder, uh, Dr. Ryan Darcy, who came up with this concept called brain vital signs. And he really took this concept from a lab and wanted to move it into a commercial medical space so that it could actually be applicable uh, to the wider population and help people understand their own brain function. So when we were trying to break down what a brain vital sign really is, and relative to other vital signs, this is kind of the idea that was come up with is that there's some key characteristics of a vital sign in general, and specifically here in a brain vital sign. If you think of other neuroimaging methods like MRI, um, you know, they are expensive. They're very spatially aware, but they're expensive and they're, they're difficult to get uh, access to. So the key thing we want to do is make sure we have a deployable device. So at the point of care, so if you go to your doctor's office, you can get it done there. It's very simple and automated. And this sort of the software piece is critical for us. It's basically, you know, you push some buttons and you go and there's not much to think about has very simple and intuitive results that uh, you know most clinicians who aren't neurologically trained can understand to help with their treatment plans. 
it's quick. And in this case, our test is roughly six minutes. So again, you know, an MRI scan could take anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. They brought that down and then very low cost. And again, this, the, the principle here is to make this accessible to as many people as possible. And similar to what I'm sure many of you are going through, this was an idea born in a lab. Uh, so these are, you know, a few select publications that have come out over the last few years that all have, you know, brain vital signs concepts. And this is sort of our method of disclosing our IP, uh, which is one way to do it as well as to actually get your publications out into public domain. And then it's tough for people to snake you because you've made it accessible. So we've done some IP protection this way, which I'm really happy with as a, as a pathway for us. Um, but it was born in the lab. And in 2016, uh, it was decided to take it into a clinical application. This concept of basically taking brain function analysis, which is done through EEG. So you're seeing an EEG cap here, electroencephalography, commonly done in clinics, but very complicated usually. And so we decided to take this, simplify the entire process, build intuitive software, and get this approved into a medical device called the NeuroCatch platform. And in short, what we do is, uh, you know, a patient will sit uh, in, a, in a testing room, they'll put on this cap, uh, which has eight electrodes on it. Uh, you fill some gel in the electrodes, give them some headphones, and they listen to a sequence of tones and word pairs. And the idea is those tones and word, word pairs have already been scientifically validated you know, over the last 70 years. This, this isn't new science, uh, but it hasn't been clinically applied. So those tones and word pairs, when we measure the brain responses to those word pairs, we can actually assess cognitive function in terms of attention, sensory function, and cognition. So we give a very clinically intuitive report on how to actually use those. And we provide that back to the clinician who can give that back to their patient. So we actually got a Health Canada class two medical device license back in 2019 uh, for the first version of this product, which honestly I would call a beta. You know, we're getting a lot of feedback from it. It's a limited release in Canada. We have about 45 of them across the country. And then we're currently finishing up our second version of this, which is called NeuroCatch 2, uh, which is very much more focused on the AI platforms. And we're moving towards software as a medical device. So you can see our situation is a bit different from Robert's. We have hardware here that goes on the patient and it's required for the function. But one of the nice things that you can do with the FDA is actually start to pull these things apart. So you can have the headset be one medical device application, which actually we leverage other partners who already have. Uh, this is actually a very smart thing that I'm proud of we did, that we did. We leverage our partners at clearances already. So we bought headsets that already have medical device clearances and we don't have to worry about that as much anymore. And then we focus on the software. So you can pull these apart to then make your software a medical device independent of the hardware you're working with. And that's what we're working towards as a company right now. So I wanna translate this a bit. So that's a bit about our device. And I'm actually gonna kind of walk through our story by just walking through the processes that I've learned. So, you know, you have a great idea and this might be many of you in the room right now. What do you do with it? Well, how do you actually take it from idea to, you know, medical device or wellness product, wherever you wanna go? And so I love these images. There was a contest a few years ago with children who had to uh, sort of create inventions and the ones who got to win actually had someone fabricate their inventions for them. This is Georgia, she's 11 years old. Um, and her invention was a Pringle puller. Uh, that basically was a hook that goes underneath the Pringle. Pringle. You can see in her definition here, she's thinking about her customer. Uh, it's a hook that gets you Pringles. Uh, it's good for anyone two years and over. Uh, so if you're two years old, you can use this thing because people struggle to get Pringles out of the can. Well, here's a cure. Perfect. George has made a really nice pitch about why we should build the Pringle dispenser. So there are some ideas that could potentially be valuable. Maybe this one is. There are some that might be useless. So it's important to have you know people in your life who can help you with these things and will tell you things honestly too. Uh, here's a pair of AirPod chopsticks, uh, maybe useful, uh, potentially not for me. Here's some high heels with umbrellas on the tips of the toes and a USB pet rock. Um, maybe fun to have around, maybe useless, and you need someone in your life who can tell you that. Very important thing. Um, and some might not be possible. Uh, so many of you might have heard of Theranos, which is supposed to be the one tiny drop of blood that changes everything. Uh, turns out it was a complete fake. Uh, and their founder, Elizabeth Holmes, is actually on trial right now uh, because of all the money that she built and all the claims that she made. So you can get yourself in a lot of trouble uh, by, in this case, falsifying clinical trial data and uh, basically saying your device can do something it absolutely cannot do. So just good things to be aware of. So what do you want to do with your idea? So again, I'm going to try and walk through some of the things I've learned along the way uh, in terms of this process. Unfortunately, with the limited time, I can only touch on three of the seven things I'd love to really dive into, but I want to talk about product market fit, uh, defining and understanding your users and their specific needs. Of course, there's pieces about your business model and pre protecting your IP, which I'm very glad Radhika and uh, Yannick talked about at the beginning and seeking funding. And then 
partially determining whether it's a medical device or a wellness product. And so Robert touched on that as well. I'll talk about it a little bit more. And then I'll give a few pointers on commercialization as well at the end. So for me, you know, this might seem intuitive, but this was a big learning for me as we really embarked into the second generation of this product. Um, and at the same time, I think it was maybe one of the things we could have done better with the first generation is really defining this process of who is our product and what is what is our product side and who is the market it's going to fit with. Uh, so this is a classic picture. If you search up product market fit, you're going to see this picture a lot. And the idea here is people often start with the product and do not think about the market. And the, the concept here is you need to start with the bottom of the pyramid. So defining your target customer, what are their underserved needs? Where do they really struggle and where can you actually help? And then define the value proposition to match those underserved needs, build the features from that, and then finalize with the user experience. So I'll walk you through what NeuroCatch is here in terms of our product market fit and where we think we're heading. So for NeuroCatch, we are looking at neurofocused clinicians. So basically neurologists, physical ther therapists, who have an emphasis on neurological wellness or neurological well-being in their practice. That's our customer. Um, their underserved need is that they have inability to reliably measure cognitive function after brain injury at the point of care. They often have to send people for secondary costly tests that can take time uh, and be very expensive. So that's, you know, it's a challenge right now that there's no assessment they can do to reliably measure brain function. So here's where our product fits. So if we can match our value proposition, again, a term that you heard earlier today, we have proposed, or we have, a rapid point of care, scientifically validated objective measurement of cognitive function to assist clinicians with aiding and diagnosis of brain injury at the point of care. So this is our proposition back to those clinicians who are looking for this tool. In terms of features, we have, again, easy, easy to use software, push button simplicity, reliable data acquisition, uh, comparison to reference ranges, and immediate reporting after the scan is done. And in terms of the user experience, you know, we tried to make it simple, but really importantly, we have, we have and continue to validate our experience with potential end users and improve it continuously with feedback. So again, this, this should match very well with what Robert said, but this simple diagram and walking through this exercise can save you a lot of time and money um, when you're trying to identify what you're building and who it's for. So this kind of walks me into design thinking, another really important concept I've learned along the way. Um, and you'll, you'll get my gist here. I'm really focusing on one piece and, you know, you can fall into a bit of a trap when you define your product market fit incorrectly. And so what you're looking at here is a nice simple image of on the y-axis, the vision for your customer. So, you know, is it uncon unconvincing when you're pitching it or is it a compelling story? And on the x-axis, you see the depth of customer engagement. So are, are you listening or are you in an echo chamber where you're just hearing your fans and building what they want? And so at the top right of this, you have product market fit. So if you're listening to your customer and you have a compelling story, you're gonna find product market fit. Where you don't want to end up is in the bottom left, where you are in an echo chamber and you have an unconvincing story and you're deceiving yourself. Uh, this is a, these are technology first companies that think they're you know God's gift to everything, and actually they are not engaging with their customers at all. And this is where design thinking can really help. So design thinking is a human centered approach to innovation that draws from the designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of people, the possibilities of technology, and the requirements for business success. You'll see it's all three. So it's needs of people technology and business success, not one of those three. And there's a simple model for this as well. And I'll, I've cut off part of it because I think this is where a lot of, you know, new ideas get stuck before they can even, you know, hit the ground running is often from the lab, you have an idea that you're really, really invested in. You spent a lot of time thinking about, you prototyped it, you maybe you've tested it in the lab and you're really invested in the concept, but this is the echo chamber problem. What you need to remember is that there is a front end of this model where you absolutely have to start by empathizing with your end user. What is their problem? Where are their pain points? What's the friction? And then you can define that specific solution to that problem before getting into full ideation. And you'll notice also there's lots of arrows going backwards. So, you know, you get through the process, you go try it again, you prototype, you ideate, you prototype, you ideate, you test with your users. Um, and you kind of keep cycling through this process before you actually get to completion of the product. I think a lot of new product founders, software or otherwise, start at the idea stage and forget to empathize with their end user. And, and again, I think that's a big learning for us as we've gone through the process um, is really learning to empathize, empathize with those end users. So another big piece here is avoid doing everything for everyone. Classic Steve Jobs quote, uh, again, one of our big learnings, I think we're getting much more focused these days is that people think focus means saying yes to all the things you've got to focus on, but that's not what it means at all. 
It means saying no to the hundred other good ideas that there are. You have to pick carefully. I'm actually as proud of the things that we have not done as the things I have done. Innovation is saying no to a thousand things. Uh, really, really hard when you get excited about stuff, but I think as you get more experienced in this world, um, you actually get pretty good at saying no uh, once you can really focus on the, on your business model as it came out earlier. I spend my last few minutes here just talking about whether your idea, you know, again, we've gone through that path if you have an idea, is it a medical device at all? And so I'm going to throw up three images here. Um, if I had more time, I'd quiz you, but you know, two of these are medical devices and one is not. Uh, so on the, on the left, we have a blood pressure monitor. I think that's the obvious one. Uh, in the middle, we have a tongue depressor. Uh, when you say, ah, this is actually a medical device, a class one medical device, because it's got to be sterile and go in your mouth. And a Fitbit, which gives you a ton of information on your heart rate, your health overall, is not a medical device. And so you might wonder why. Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. And this is, again, where the regulations are still catching up uh, to where you know, technology is heading. And they're, they're starting to get better at defining these things. Health Canada has a very broad definition of a medical device. So you know, any article, instrument, apparatus, or uh, contrivance that including any component, part, or accessory thereof, manufactured, sold, or represented for use in the medical treatment of human beings. There's a whole guidance on this you can read. Um, but the bottom line is you think it's a medical device, it probably is. Most of the things you're imagining probably are. Where it gets gray is in digital health. And this is probably what you're interested in, is there's really a blurring of lines between wellness and medical uh, health products that are primarily software based. So if you look at the furthest left column here, this is digital health. These include things like your Fitbit, with, which are, you know, they engage customers for lifestyle, wellness, and health related purposes. They capture or store data, but they do not, you know, provide treatment and they do not provide uh, any sort of clinically meaningful uh, measurement. So they don't require clinical evidence and they're not a medical device according to the FDA and Health Canada today. You know, this may change over time. Digital medicine is a bit of a gray area. So in some cases, you know, they may intervene in the service of human health. Um, clinical evidence is still required. These days, this is likely to become a medical device. It's unlikely you'll get through it without becoming a medical device, but you have to look through the standards very deeply on this. And therapeutics, anything that actually intervenes will be a medical device. You can almost guarantee on that. Uh, if you're actually intervening in someone's health, you're gonna be considered a medical device. So again, there's good guidance on this from the FDA. Um, I'm happy to share links later, but there are, there are some blurred lines and actually, Another key learning that Robert touched upon is actually just talk to the FDA and talk to Health Canada. Uh, they are generally always your friends in these situations. They are focused on patient safety. And so they will help you with you know, answering yes or no questions about whether you think your device is wellness or not, uh, and really just walking through that path. So you know, find a contact, build a relationship as early as possible and get those answer questions answered. Um, last couple of thoughts here. So again, very briefly, Health Canada device classifications. I mentioned that NeuroCatch is a class two device. What does that mean? Uh, it's all based on risk. So if you have a low risk device, uh, you're a class one. And in some cases, you don't need a device license for class one. So that's a nice place to be if you can get there. Uh, two, three, and four, you always need a license. Uh, and it just goes up based on the risk. So as you get to implants and things that are you know, invasive, you definitely get into the moderate and high risk devices. Um, again, there's a there's a flow chart you can walk through Health Canada to kind of define where your device lands, and our device lands as a, as a class two, where where you know commonly a lot of devices uh, will will end up. Okay, last couple of slides here. You know, I just want to wrap up with okay, you find out you're developing a medical device. What comes next? I won't repeat too much what Robert said because this is a critical one, and again, another major learning: a quality management system. Uh, you need one of these. And it was a big uh, surprise, I guess, for myself to understand what the heck this was. And really, again, the idea here is just to make sure that any company that's engaging in building a medical device is doing it safely and effectively. And it's a full documentation system of everything you've done um, that will be audited regularly. So it's it's critical to get this done and your license can be pulled uh, with, a, with, a, with a poor audit. So I won't say much more about it apart from that it exists. Um, and it involves all of these things around the circle and a lot more. So finding yourself an experienced professional early in this process, again, uh, is a really critical learning uh, in that way. And luckily we had that and we still do. So that's been helpful. Um, in terms of stage gates, so this is actually the F a very common FDA waterfall diagram of medical device development stage gates. Again, Robert touched on the agile process. So you can actually involve agile in this waterfall, me waterfall method. Uh, it's tricky, but it's definitely doable. And there's lots of advice on how to do that on the internet. Um, this should look similar to design thinking, which is actually really nice. So you match your user needs um, to the end output and you can actually really follow this process to get yourself through the medical device, device development stage gates. 
Uh, but these are common design stage gates throughout the entire medical device process. And finally, who's going to who's going to pay for your device? So, is it the patient? Is it the clinician? Is it a hospital executive? Is it an employer, insurance, government, whoever it might be? It's really important to think about that early and have that built into your uh, regulatory plan and your design plan. You might have to design the device specifically to make sure that the payment can be done correctly and that you match existing fee codes uh, that might already be on the market. You, you don't really want to try and create fee codes for your device. It's a very long and complicated process. Uh, you want to try and find ones that exist and piggyback those already. Uh, so defining that very early and getting that part of your plan from the beginning is a critical part of your business model uh, moving this forward. So now I'm just over time, but I'm just going to, this is my final slide. Um, if you get through all that and you're thinking of commercializing, great. Um, that's fantastic. Here's kind of a quick summary of, you know, again, my learnings in that process. So be open-minded. Your idea is probably not close to perfect. So the moment you get too attached to your idea, it's probably going to fail. You have to be able to pivot and be agile with your thinking and have a team around you that can actually do the same. Again, very critical to build that team that way. Uh, find a mentor or advisor or consultants as early as possible in the process. So, you know, again, I, I really resonate with Robert. Robert said finding a CEO, finding you know people who are experts at this early and bringing them on board. Uh, pitch early and pitch often. Uh, you're going to do this your entire career, so you know take every opportunity you get. Some might not go very well. You'll take the feedback and you'll make it better. Uh, take all those chances, and you never know what can come from them. Identify your core customer as early as possible. Know your market, your competitors, and your potential partners. So it turns out some of your competitors might actually be partners, and you might want to talk to them and figure out how you can carve out the market independently from one each other, one and each other. I clearly understand your customer needs and pain points. Again, going back to design thinking before you build your device, define your value propositions. So the cost, time, efficiency. It's good to be repeating some of these things that came up earlier. Uh, fail fast because you're probably going to fail a few times. Um, so don't spend too much time getting to the end. Move, you know, again, this is nice for software as you can be agile, you can learn things very quickly and go back to the drawing board uh, to get it right. Um, and be persistent and ready to adapt. So things are not going to go to plan. You might have the best plan in the world. It's not going to happen that way. Um, so being quick on your feet, being a bit resilient that way is really critical uh, in this process because it, you know, it just doesn't go the way you think it's going to go. Uh, and then, you know, make it a reality. So luckily for Georgia, she won this competition. There's her Pringle hook. Uh, and now she can eat all 60 pretzels in one shot rather than having to go one at a time. And I would like to get my hands on one of those. Uh, thanks very much. I uh, appreciate all the time. And I, I believe we have a few minutes for questions, but I know we're getting pretty close to the, to the end of the hour here. Awesome. Very great talk. Uh, thank you very much. Hopefully the, the takeaway message won't be the, the Pringle hook, but the, the <laughs> FDA talk, uh, talk with the FDA and Health Canada, I think that uh, that was a very powerful message as well that we hear a lot. Uh, we see these uh, regular bodies as kind of like uh, the big hate, evil that you try to avoid or navigate or save uh, cost and time, uh, but actually they, they want to work with you. Uh, the FDA is definitely has uh, shifted gears as well to be a bit more agile in the way that they uh, they interact with the, with, the, with the company. They try to, they're not there to stop the progress or innovation, but they're not there to make you money. Um, so they are there to protect the public. So get uh, get in touch as early as possible. So that, for me, that was the big, uh, the big take on message. Uh, uh, but the Pringle hook was a, was a pretty good image. Um, so Radhika and Robert, if you uh, want to open your mic and join us, uh, we might go slightly over time because we have some some questions and uh, I didn't want to stop the speaker and I personally uh, went over time as well. So uh, if people have a hard deadline at uh, 12, feel free to, uh, to drop out. Um, and if the speakers are willing to stay just a few more minutes so that we can answer questions and bring uh, as much value as possible. So I would start with the first. So we have the two questions that are uh, a bit linked, uh, but that can be, uh, that can be answered uh, from, uh, from both, uh, both companies. Um, the first question from Teresa was, uh, what are the restrictions you face when working with patients? I would assume to go through an ethics committee to get surveys and interactions approved in the clinic. So that's the first part. I would assume that that's maybe before or during the clinical trial. Um, so the, there is the, how do you work with patients and ethics and all that. And then another question that might, uh, that could be linked or not. Um, Robert, you mentioned AI Fred going into clinical trial. How did you approach that process? Have you collaborated with academic lab uh, or are you doing it independently? What were some major roadblocks and in contrast, some easier steps? 
So from the clinical trial data ethics, if you want to elaborate a bit more on the, the process. Uh, let's start with Robert and then uh, Bimal, uh, your, your take. Sure, I can talk about this for hours. Um, it is it is a really deep question, um, but I'll try to cover the, the most important parts. Uh, for the talking with patients, uh, you don't necessarily always have to think of patients in the context of the clinical trial. Sometimes certain like clinics or hospitals will have like patient like study groups or like patient uh, inter like a set of patients that are designed to like interact with incoming like ideas and then like it's like a panel basically like a patient panel that you can discuss with. Um, so there's other avenues as opposed to just going through a clinical trial uh, because when you go into a clinical trial, everything that you ask, every questionnaire. Um, every every question has to be properly documented and, and regulated. Um, so it's a little bit harder for you to, you know, to like, you know, willy nilly ask questions and like validate uh, hypotheses and ideas and assumptions uh, early. Um, so you want to, you know, try to leverage both, try to get in on these like, you know, patient panel groups or like physician panel groups uh, to try to ask uh, and validate those early assumptions. Because when you get to a clinical setting, there's not much you can change uh, once you get there. Um, Try to answer the first question. Ethics committee definitely every time. Um, it's it's not safe to you know just go like for example we deal with a lot of patients who suffer from depression are sometimes uh, you know uh, mentally ill so there's a lot of uh, sensitivity in that space so you can't just ask them you know questions about that without having proper ethics. Around. A lot of times uh, certain groups uh, you have like I think they're called like ERBs uh, where you uh, grow to these uh, committees and these boards and you ask for approval so that you can interact uh, with these individuals under these certain uh, uh, these certain situations and scenarios. Um, so definitely always ask first before you just go and like ask questions, especially when we deal with a clinical setting. Um, if I can quickly take a stab at the second question, uh, clinical, what is it like to, to go into a clinical trial? Um, this is something that, that Bimal also mentioned, which is finding a person who understands the regulatory space a lot, and ideally who has conducted clinical trials before, um, like I myself have not. So we definitely really depend on our uh, network to, to give us that information. And ideally having someone internally, like a clinical trial coordinator or like a you know, VP of you know, regulatory or, or running clinical trials, because um, those individuals would be responsible for it's It's more than a full-time job, honestly, to put a lot of these clinical sites together. Um, you're not working in isolation. Um, it is impossible to do that. You have to work with, uh, you know, especially when you're a startup, you don't have unlimited funds. So you're probably going to be reaching out to external. Um, there's uh, these like uh, clinical research groups that actually are designed to help you take you on as a client in running your clinical trial. Um, they can help uh, mediate a lot of conversations between you. Um, and other uh, clinical sites that you're that you'd like to participate in. Um, so there's a lot of work uh, that goes into trying to to cast the wide net and making sure that the population that you gather um, is is appropriate for the type of uh, medical advice that you're trying to test. Um, I hope that answers. If there's more specific questions around like roadblocks, you know, I could try to tackle those. But that's sort of a broad, you know, try to find someone whose whose uh, expertise is in this and they can help guide you. Yeah, Robert covered it very well. I think the, you know, the only piece I'd add that we, we have done and been lucky to do is we have, because we have the Center for Neurology Studies and we've built a relationship with an independent um, ethics board, I think coming from an academic side, again, I've done a lot of clinical research. Um, I was not well set up to do clinical research for medical devices. So it's still very different. Uh, the standards are quite different. You still require ethics, uh, but the things you have to report, the way you report them are very different from what you know, if you're, you may be used to in a research setting in academia. So it was a great learning for me to go through that process. Again, we had a, a regulatory consultant who held our hand the entire way. I think now we can do most of it ourselves, but it's been several years of learning. And I just shared a link in the chat with the um, ISO standard for good clinical practice, which is sort of the FDA requirement these days uh, for making sure you're running a, your clinical trials appropriately. It's not a free document, unfortunately. ISO makes money off everything. Uh, but if you are seriously going down this path, that's kind of a required document to have in your arsenal as well. Thank you for, for, for that answer. Um, 
Bimal, uh, one question was uh, targeted for uh, at you. The idea of NeuroCatch platform was born in the in the lab, which you later commercialized. In retrospect, would you have worked on the product commercially slash independently through uh, product commercially independently or through a uh, through a lab? Yeah, so it's, a, like, it's a great when, question. When, when do you leave? Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. When do you leave the lab for for business? I think the lab the lab is really good. I think in retrospect, probably wouldn't change it again. It wasn't my finding, but I think it's it's nice to have had the lab background because it really gave it the time to really form. The idea really formed in the lab with lower risk. So you know there, there are investors, it's you know government funding, it's university funding, but it's in the search of knowledge. Uh, whereas when you move to a commercially uh, funded uh, venture, you're you're having to meet some pretty hard deadlines very quick, and you have to please your investors at that time. So the lab gave some space to really define the product a bit better before it moved out. And I think, you know, that's actually a really, that's a big benefit that we had is to actually build the science, arsenal of science that we could refer to once we commercialize uh, and, you know, still be independent from that arm. So that, that research continues at the university. We are independent from that research now, but we actually get to build a network of people adding to the science of the device separate from us ourselves. So I, I don't think I would have changed that path. I think there could be situations where you want to do it differently, but I think for us, it really was a benefit. Okay, Bimal, this question is for you. Uh, I'm a little curious about how you navigated the regulatory environment in Canada versus the US. Maybe if you can talk us through the specific steps that you went through and whether it helps to be approved in Canada first. Yeah, so we are, you know, I wish I had a full answer because we're still applying. We're applying to the FDA in about three months. So we're, gonna, we're doing it right now. Um, you know, we've been in health with Canada for the last two years. You know, I, I think people will often say go to the U.S. first um, because if you're meeting all the you know, requirements of the U.S. application, which are significantly greater, to be quite honest, the requirement you have to submit. You know, Canada is a very trusting country. When you apply for Health Canada, you basically submit an attestation that you've done everything you have to do, and you know they'll check in the future. Uh, but it's you know a very thin application package. For the FDA, you submit the entire package. It's thousands of pages of documentation. And you put that in there. So, you know we're Assuming that you've done that for the FDA, you've got clearance, your likelihood of getting your Health Canada clearance is extremely high. Uh, in principle, the steps are actually quite similar. I mean, you're, you're basically building what's called your design history file uh, and your device master record, which is just documentation of everything that you did uh, to build the device. And it's in that waterfall image that I showed, and you're making sure that documentation is up to speed with your quality management system. So I, I don't think there's necessarily a risk of going to the US first. I think it can be harder to make the jump from Canada to the US just because you're submitting all your documentation uh, at one point. But in reality, if you're following your QMS and you're following you know, the, the guidance documents, you should have them ready for both um, at the same time, essentially. Thank you for that. That was a very full answer, given the time we have. So <laughs> I, I thought I would ask this next question for both of you. Uh, what are some of the key lessons you learned when you were approaching clients and what are maybe some of the big mistakes you made? Do I take it, Robert? <laughs> oh, wait, I muted myself. Uh, um, mistakes. I think, you know, for us, um, it's when it comes to FDA um, and all these like Health Canada regulatory bodies, they treat everyone the same, whether you're a startup or a multi-billion dollar corporation. Um, it's the same rules apply to everyone. So naturally it feels like you, you're not well resourced uh, to undertake such a, such a big thing. Um, so it can be a little bit daunting to let that, um, you know, sort of overshadow a lot of the great work or like a great idea that you have. Um, so definitely, make sure that um that you're not the the idea is if you have an idea um and you really want to you know to take it through engage with those regulatory bodies early um they can actually provide really helpful information on um like your idea how you're going to validate it um and it act, like for example when we reached out to the fda and be like hey you know this is what we'd like to do this is how we plan on doing the clinical trial they actually came back with like, you know, have you thought about this or this or like, you know, structure it this way. They can actually like help inform to make your clinical trial even more uh, resilient uh, than it was before. Um, so if you have a question, don't be afraid to ask. Um, I think it's when you put on a, you know, a pitch and a show for investors, you have to seem like, you know, you have to know as much as you can. 
but don't let that cloud your your judgment of trying to like also ask for help and questions uh, from your network. You know, try to take take advantage of both. Is that for me as well? Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, sure. And when you said clients, right, do you mean like the, the patient or the clinical end user? Or I just want to clarify. The clinical end user. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, one of the things that we've gotten to learn as well is making sure you're talking to people who aren't only early adopters uh, of, of new technology. So you think of the adoption curve, you, know, you can probably imagine it's just a, you know inverted view uh, where you have early adopters who are going to be excited about everything and they want to try new technology. I think that people are sort of the second stage who are curious, they might jump on pretty early. And then there's a big gap to the basically the bulk of the population who's going to be really interested in, or, you know, might be a bit adverse to new technology, but curious about it. And so if you end up in that those early stages, sort of getting feedback from people who are typically early adopters of new tech, you're building a product for them and not for the, the wider general clinical population. And so you really want to actually bring in some skeptics uh, into your process and get real honest feedback. And I think early in our process, we made the mistake of really sticking with our close network, which I don't think is a mistake. We were just a bit, we had a bit of a blind spot to realize they were actually all early adopters uh, and they didn't quite give us the perspective that the general practitioner would would give us. And so we've changed that since, but I think as we first got going, that was a big learning for us is to make sure really diversify the people we're talking to. Okay. Well, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Bimal, for being here with us today. This was uh, a great webinar. We learned a lot from you and got some practical insights into how you went through the process and all your learnings from it. Um, I think that's it from our side. And uh, thank you to Neurosphere for organizing the webinar. Thanks to you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.